to go. All right, there we go. Okay, cool. Um, You should be letting people in. Okay. All right. So you're set here with your, your visual and your visuals yeah. up here. Okay. All right. We'll make a little change as we go through toward the end because I need to, the camera will pick up the images. Okay. Sure. All right. That sounds good. Yeah. Can I if I take photos? I'm doing like the social media and documenting. Yeah. And, okay. I just want to get some <laughs> I can't autograph anything. I didn't bring a pen. <laughs> Maybe we'll get to that. Uh, all right, so let's go ahead and uh, get started. So my name is uh, Corey Cooper. I'm associate professor and an archaeologist in the Department of Anthropology at Purdue University and currently co-directing an archaeological field school in the Wiatnam Preserve with Dr. Michael Strzeski, who's seated right there waving. And uh, I think we've been allowed to sort of co-opt this presentation, um, which was uh, in the works and of course fits well. So thanks for, for that, uh, letting us barge in. Um, talk that fits well with uh, what we have going on. And so there's several staff and field school students here as well. So um, I'm going to introduce uh, the speaker this evening, who's going to talk about the rediscovery of Fort Wyatnon and his role in that. And so the things I know that I can say about uh, Joseph Del Bartlett, I've known for several years through the Tippecanoe County Historical Association. Um, hmm. Am I retired? I'm trying. Okay. So a recently semi-retired uh, lawyer here in Lafayette, but uh, what he himself claimed is um, uh, what he is uh, also well known for, or perhaps best known for, is his uh, love for, curiosity about, and knowledge of um, Fort Wyatnon and things associated with Fort Wyatnon. And so he's been in, involved in, uh, as I mentioned before, the, the rediscovery and making the site known. So uh, I'll just turn it over to him and he can fill you in on all the other details he wants you to know. So thanks. Thank you, Thank you Gord. When I was about eight years old, my dad had a farm out <clears throat> on the Weah Plains, which is a geographical feature in the western part of the county. And for some reason, he wanted to build a house and he wanted to scoop out a spring and make a pond out of it, uh, which sounded great to me at the time. Uh, we went on a picnic shortly after the bulldozer started working, and I found a little spear point lying in the mud. And <clears throat> it kind of lit a fire that's never gone out. And uh, when I was in college here at Purdue in the 60s, uh, my interest in prehistory collided with my interest in history. And Wiatnan, as it might turn out, is a place where uh, cultures came into conflict uh, after about 12,000 years of being separated. So what happened then was very interesting to me. Um, I'm going, anytime we talk about history and the, the integration of what we know from other sources, um, we try to cut a piece of tapestry out of a very tightly, finely woven object or blanket. And when you do that, you always leave a lot of loose strings around the edge. Those are strings that you need to follow to continue the story and it spreads from there. Uh, in 1700, uh, the French who had been in the interior of North America for uh, a century uh, had an idea to establish a trading post uh, and a fort at Detroit in 1700. And once they did that, then they started looking at how they could uh, protect their interests in the interior fur trade basically from the British uh, colonies, uh, which uh, by that time had been uh, developing for 
a hundred years or more. And there, there had been a war between the French and the Fox Indians who occupied Northern, what became Northern Illinois for control of a, a uh, portage there, uh, which made travel to the interior of North America easier than uh, over land. Uh, so the Fox were difficult. <clears throat> And one of the, one of the uh, officers in the French Marines sent to deal with the Fox was a, a name, Captain Dubizon. The reason he got eventually associated with Wiatnans is because the Wiatnans at that time in the first uh, decade of the 18th century had asked the governor of Canada to send them three things, a priest, a blacksmith, and a captain. And you would wonder why would they insist on a captain? Because a lieutenant is still an officer in the French Marines. But the natives knew that a captain had battle experience and was a good leader. And they wanted somebody like that at Wiadna. So anyway, Governor Vaudrio uh, established a fort, a palisaded fort at Wiadna, uh, beginning in uh, about 1717. Uh, to 1721, uh, and it took 12 Marines that much time to com complete a palisade around what had become a little trading enclave. Uh, the traders would have valuable goods in their huts, in their storage sheds, inside the palisade to protect them from uh, everything. <laughs> given the fact that, well, I'm jumping ahead, but given the fact that there was a village of Native Americans across the river uh, made it necessary to take some reasonable precautions uh, because alcohol was available. And we all know what happens when partying takes place. Things happen that we don't want to happen. So anyway, uh, 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 an established uh, policy protected the traders and their property. Um, Vaudrill, who was the governor uh, of Canada at the time, reported uh, that this was undoubtedly the finest uh, palisade fort in the upper country. The upper country meaning upper Canada, which kind of reverse of what you think in school, upper Canada is further in up the streams from the St. Lawrence Seaway. So we were here in uh, upper Canada at that time. So we're looking for two things. We're looking for Fort Wiatnan's location, and we're looking for what it is, what it was, because nobody drew maps of the fort. Nobody had a, a building plan. Uh, no sketches were ever made. Uh, all we have is the descriptions of eyewitnesses who uh, were actually there. So I've, in my research, I tried to uh, avoid tertiary sources or secondary sources because it's amazing how many mistakes even the best scholars sometimes make by making assumptions uh, of things that they don't have actually nailed down. Of course, if you wrote a book with a footnote for every sentence, nobody would open it. Uh, it'd be so much. So we're looking at primary sources. Then um, this is one that's handwritten uh, on in January of 1762. <clears throat> um, this is uh, Lieutenant John Butler, who was sent to Wiatnan by the British Army to take possession of Wiatnan from the French. Try to, try to keep you in perspective as we go along. Uh, Amherst, a British general, was assigned to command the North American British Army during the Seven Years' War, which began around 1757. And so by 1762, it was all, all done but the paperwork. Uh, and Amherst sent uh, Butler to take uh, possession of the fort. And he reported that the fort uh, was a stockade 100 feet by 150 uh, on, the, on the north of the bank of the Wabash, uh, 60 leagues from the Miami. The Miami fort was up where Fort Wayne is now. And he gave a description of uh, what he uh, saw there. 
Uh, and one of the important things that uh, we should learn from his visit is that the site of the fort flooded, usually every spring, but not always. And in this particular case, he said that there had been four to six feet of water inside the fort. So where you guys are doing archaeology right now, sometimes is that much underwater. Not recently, but back then. So we know we have a stockade uh, on the north side of the river, uh, sometimes floods. So jumping a little bit ahead, uh, after the British took uh, possession, Amherst represented to the native people a, a new policy. Uh, the British Indian Department uh, was being more influenced by the military at this point. And the French uh, policy was to make gifts to the native people to get them to do what they wanted, to cajole them. And so uh, Amherst put a stop to that. And uh, at the same time, uh, an Ottawa named Pontiac organized a resistance to the British, uh, trying to get uh, a movement built to return control to the French. Uh, and he didn't, it didn't work, but before it was over, they had taken control of several forts in the Northwest, including Wiatnon. Uh, Lieutenant Jenkins was in charge at Wiatnon during this uh, period. <clears throat> and uh, so about two years after the movement started, uh, the English were able to convince uh, most of the groups to back off and maintain some kind of peaceful relationship with uh, the native people. Uh, the English had a, an agent out named George Crone, an Irishman that had a thriving trading business in Pennsylvania, and then he became an employee of the uh, British Indian Department. And Crone uh, was actually with a group uh, down close to the Ohio River. And they were set upon by a group of Kickapoo who pronounced them captives and hauled them back to Wiatnon. Uh, at that point, uh, they had to pass a couple of villages down by the Vermilion River. And the, the native people there warned the Kickapoo, we think we're at peace. And what you are doing is going to start a whole new war. So when Crone got back to uh, Wiatnon, uh, he met with, allegedly met with Pontiac. Uh, Pontiac's whereabouts were hard to pin down at that point, but he did send emissaries to Wiatnon for sure. And a peace was reached that ended what was called Pontiac's War. Um, and as it works out, uh, we learn things in fits and starts. Uh, usually it's at some point when uh, the military is involved because military people have been trained to observe and report accurately because their, their advancement depends on that and they know that their superiors need reliable information to make good decisions. So it's no accident that Lieutenant John Butler gave us information, that Lieutenant Jenkins gave us some information uh, Crone gave information. Uh, the next event in uh, Wiatnon's history that gives us more information, um, Crone's report uh, mentions that the Kickapoo and the Mascutin have uh, villages near the fort that is on the, the, the north side of the river, which we've heard about, but we didn't know for sure until we got to today. Anyway, um, this is just more confirmation uh, that the fort is on the right bank of the river, about 70 yards from the river, uh, and that the Wiatnon Nation of Indians is on the opposite side. And they kind of an ama amusing pronunciation of Kickapoo there. Kickapoozies are around the fort. And they estimate at that time uh, about a thousand men able to bear arms, which was significant, uh, a significant force for anyone vying for control of the area to be allied with. Okay, we already talked about uh, Butler uh, coming and observing the fort and confirming along with another a lieutenant in the uh, British Army, uh, Dietrich Brim, 
who became a cartographer, uh, Brehm reported the same things that um, Butler reported about the fort being flooded in the springtime. And that's important in the long run because as it turned out, a lot of people looked a lot of places for the fort above the floodplain and thought intuitively that it would be necessary for it to be there. Um, Hamilton uh, came, okay, let's back up. Who's Hamilton? Uh, Detroit's governor in, uh, during the Revolutionary War was an, uh, a former British officer named Henry Hamilton. Uh, he had resigned the commission as a colonel to be appointed as Lieutenant Governor of Detroit. While he was there during the revolution, uh, George Rogers Clark, a Virginian leader of their militia, had orders from the Virginia government to act on behalf of the colonies, cross the Ohio River and take as many posts uh, that were controlled by the British as possible. So Hamilton uh, did that, uh, took control of Vincennes uh, and uh, uh, Clark. Uh, Clark was in uh, Kaskaskia at the time and decided to uh, come back and do a winter raid on Vincennes to take it back. How did Hamilton get to Vincennes in the first place? Well, he had a convoy that originated in Detroit uh, with a lot of uh, Canadian uh, volunteers and uh, some regulars and a lot of native people. And uh, he came down the river in the winter of 1778, got to Weatnam uh, in early December and reading his journal is amazing. Uh, the officers were never worked with the men, but on this convoy, they had to, because when they started from Detroit, the temperature was in the 30s and 40s. By the time they got to where Logan Sport is now, uh, they were having to break the ice with their feet and with poles, and the men were getting their legs cut by the ice they had to come out of the water every half mile. Uh, and we're talking about boats that are 32 feet long, bateaux. They would hold 10 tons of goods. <clears throat> anyway, he got to Weatnam and he was, his campaign was to pick up more native people on the way, which he did. Uh, he got to Weatnam and there was some reluctance, but he brought a six pound cannon made a brass with him and fired it several times at a target at 100 yards and hit a one foot square repeatedly. And I think the only reason he did that was to intimidate them not to work with the British or not to work with the Americans. <clears throat> anyway, as a foot, footnote on that, uh, a six pound ball has been found uh, near the site of the fort. And he reported that they fired the cannon uh, numerous times while there at Weatna. Um, another important thing was uh, that he helped us with um, he made uh, some uh, an observation in a letter to Haldeman, his superior, uh, that the fort is a miserable stockade surrounding a dozen wretched cabins called houses. Uh, the British weren't very complimentary of the French in much any way. Their culture, their habits, their housing, their construction techniques. Um, so Hamilton, if the guy, the guy was a sketch, a sketch artist, he, if he just sketched what he saw, instead of giving us that, I, I, I'll be happy. Um, let me see if I'm far enough along. <clears throat> I'm not. In 1788, uh, a decade later, a resident of Kaskaskia named William Biggs was captured by a group of Kickapoo. Uh, amazing story. He rode for miles on his horse. He was wearing a buffalo robe, couldn't get it disentangled. Uh, they eventually caught up with him and uh, he could not outrun them. And anyway, they brought him back to Weatnam. Actually, they didn't refer, he didn't refer to it as Weatnam. He referred to it as the Kickapoo Trading Town. So we may glean from that that 
The stockade didn't look like much of a stockade anymore by that time. Built out of the best wood available, which probably was hickory, uh, a stockade would only last maximum 25 years, according to the people I've spoken to. Uh, and <clears throat> the only reason I mentioned hickory is because uh, during the, one of the early seasons of archaeology, a well was excavated and the last six feet was hickory cribbing, still intact, still in place. Unfortunately, when the crew went to lunch, the walls caved in and they decided it was too difficult, too uh, dangerous to try to re-excavate it. But there's a lot of information that's probably still available there. So anyway, Biggs uh, mentions a couple of things that are kind of important to help associate it with Wiatnan uh, as far as the old uh, Kickapoo trading town. He mentions by name two traders who were at Wiatnan at the time he was there. One was a gentleman named McCausland, uh, and the other was Bazadone. Uh, McCausland was a, a well-known trader up and down the valley, and Bazadone was mentioned as a trader at Vincennes at some times. Bazadone was Spanish. Uh, McCausland was Anglo, obviously. Um, and McCausland traded at Kethtipikinuk, which is up the river 18 miles. He was a, a mason, and I'm not a scientist, so I can get away with this. A mason ring has been recovered from Kethtipikinuk. So it's, it's interesting to speculate. You can't do science that way, uh, but it's fascinating that little pieces like that come together eventually. Okay, so where we are now is uh, after, after Biggs bought his uh, freedom and got back to Kaskaskia, uh, in, at the end of the Revolutionary War, the colonial government of now the United States um, had a very depleted treasury. They owed France a lot of money. Uh, they had just kicked the British on paper out of the Northwest Territory. So it doesn't take much of rocket science to connect the dots. The only way to generate revenue in that situation is to sell land as fast as you can. The Northwest Territory had become a vacuum, a power vacuum. The US had no standing military after the Revolutionary War. They had no treasury to build one. Uh, so, the, so they set out to try to begin a program of buying the land from not, not buying selling land. And uh, there were three treaties between 1784 uh, and 86, where uh, commissioners on behalf of the United States tried to convince the Indians that they had defeated Great Britain and that now they were the owners of the territory that Great Britain had. And the Miamis weren't dummy people. They they were being fed information and strategy through the Indian Department of the British Indian Department. Alexander McKee and uh, uh, Matthew Elliott were two very capable agents. And with their urging, they convinced the Indians to present a position that, to, the, to the American commissioners that the British did not own this land. All they had was our permission to be here. And you do not have that, and they do not now either. Uh, and so the uh, commissioners went back to Washington. President Washington directed them to go back and say, okay, okay, we don't own it by conquest. We will buy it from you. And they said, then we don't want to sell it. So where do you go from there? Well, you have an Indian war. And that's what happened in 1790. Uh, Washington began an Indian war to uh, deceive the, uh, the Indian people of their title to the land, uh, according to accept, accepted military and, and civil law. Uh, the fight started, uh, Arthur St. Clair was uh, named as the governor of the Northwest Territory by President Washington. And St. Clair's job was to try to clean up the territory, so to speak, to uh, take possession physically, of sites where the Indians had concentrated power. And I referred back and forth between Indians and native people. We all know who we're talking about. So I hope nobody's offended by that. Uh, anyway, 
St. Clair sent a general named Harmar north on an expedition against uh, the area we now call Fort Wayne that was called Kikionga by the Miami people. <clears throat> and Kikionga had become a focal point of the confederation of the Shawnee remnant groups that had been forced out of Ohio uh, and back into the Southern Ohio area and eventually then back north to the Ma uh, Maumee River. Uh, Hard, or, uh, Harmar was not a trained guerrilla fighter. He was a conventional a European style army fighter. Uh, and besides that, he had a significant contingent of militiamen from Kentucky who at the time were more interested in spoils of war than they were tactics and strategy. So, you know, it's, it's the Hollywood Indian story. The Indians come riding across the hill and thumb their noses at the militia and then take back over the hill. And of course, the militia guys are being told by the regulars, don't take the bait, don't take the bait. Anyway, Harmar's militiamen did, they got ruined. Uh, Harmar came back uh, and resigned and that was the end of Harmar. But the problem still existed. So St. Clair uh, then uh, organized the, the army himself and led a, a group uh, against Kikionga in 1791. Unfortunately for him, uh, he relied upon uh, government contractors who were friends of President Washington and didn't always get things done on time. Uh, his army waited from September when they were supposed to march at Cincinnati until November, late October actually, before they got the shoes, uh, the clothing, uh, the provisions that had been necessary to set up the expedition in the first place. That late in the year, uh, nobody liked to fight because it got cold, uh, but they were stuck with it. Uh, anyway, before St. Clair actually got underway in late November, the previous June, uh, St. Clair and uh, Washington directed a Kentucky retired Revolutionary War general named Charles Scott to conduct a raid against the Weah towns. Now the Weah towns <clears throat> are referred to are, I'm gonna jump across this because we don't need it. That, that was Scott. Scott's an interesting character. He was a very successful uh, officer during the Revolutionary War. He retired to Kentucky. Uh, three of his four sons were killed by uh, native people in fights, uh, one, of, one of whom, was killed right across the river and there wasn't anything he could do about it. But besides uh, all that in his background, he was a pretty magnanimous guy. He still had nobility about it. Uh, he was charged with uh, organizing and conducting a raid against the Weah towns. Uh, and in June of 1791, he uh, arrived at a point called High Gap over on the Weah Plains, about four miles south of Weah. Um, he said he could see the smoke fires at noon from the town. Uh, and so they marched straight north from there, uh, 800 strong. And these were dragoons. Dragoons are not cavalry. Dragoons ride their horse to the fight and get off and fight on foot. Cavalrymen mm. fight differently. They fight from the horse. Anyway, these were all dragoons. They were... Uh, all militia from the northern uh, counties of Kentucky. And uh, I guess how it fits in strategically, it was, it was done to dissuade the Wea from joining the Miami at the Maumee River site. Uh, his instructions were to attack and burn the villages, take as many pr prisoners as possible and bring them back uh, to the American forts on the Ohio River. Uh, which he did. He brought back 40 prisoners from his attack on Wiatnan. Uh, what he didn't know at the time was that the British agents thought Scott was going to Fort Wayne to Kikionga because he made a feint in that direction as he left the mouth of the Kentucky River. Then he swerved left, aimed for Wiatnan. Meantime, 500 fighting men from Wiatnan were sent to Kikionga to meet Scott there, of course, he never showed up. 
and they were gone when Scott got to Vietnam. Scott had virtually no opposition. Um, looking at a topographical map, he reported that uh, as he approached the edge of the valley, there was a protrusion of woods out into the prairie. And uh, on, on a map, aerial map today, you can still see that. Uh, the a ravine sticks out about 200 yards into the, the prairie and the woods are still growing around it. So when he came around that, uh, he encountered one house, one hut, and they dispatched, I think, four uh, Weah who were living there. And he was surprised because he thought that the Weah town was up on the high ground, not down on the, the river level. Uh, and why is that important? Well, not really in locating the place, but uh, it is uh, said that uh, one of the traders from Vincennes, Antoine Gamelin, was a confidant of the US military and used for uh, negotiating and intelligence purposes. And uh, he wasn't named as a, a spy with Scott, but we think he was with him uh, because Scott said, my guides are strangers to the company, country I'm in, which meant that I, they were sandbagging for some reason. And as it turns out, uh, there's, there's evidence that Gamelin had a wheel wife at Wiatnan and he wanted uh, plenty of time for the town to be warned before they arrived with the soldiers. Just another footnote of history. Okay, so uh, we're looking for we're looking for a stockade, uh, roughly the size that we said. Um, there was a, a mention early in the history of the research on Vietnam that it was at the mouth of the River de Bois Rouge, or um, as it was translated later, Redwood River. Um, and we were just talking before the, the program, there was uh, the creek called the Weah Creek today used to empty in Okay. Audio got But quickly, in the original survey of the area, uh, which I'm not showing you. Uh, it was reported by the surveyor that uh, along the section line uh, where section 28 uh, is now, we know, uh, within about 30 or 40 yards of where the fort was located, there was one tree, only one tree on the entire section line, which meant to me that there had to been firewood for we out none. Uh, it's possible that the stockade uh, was used for firewood. Uh, when that idea was proposed, then I thought, well, hell, every year it, it floods and more firewood's brought in. So I, I'm not sure you'd have to go cut down trees for a year's supply of wood. Uh, anyway, we're looking, everybody was looking for a, uh, um, I may be at the end of this, this one, Jeff. Can I go on with this? Let me put back on this a second. If we try now. Oh, okay. Here's a couple of maps that uh, came across in papers uh, that Dr. Weatherill had collected uh, that were uh, previously collected by a gentleman named Amos Butler, uh, who I haven't tied him together with Butler University yet, but he was extremely interested in locating Wiatnan and learning more about it. 
uh, this map was in his uh, folder and it generally shows, uh, I'm going to point to this point right here. That was the point of interest uh, at that time that they, they believed that's where the fort might have been. Uh, and the only reason they, they believed that is because they had found uh, some burn area and some burials uh, and some trade goods, things like that, that are indi indicating that there was a habitation there. <clears throat> but we know now, and we'll get there eventually, the fort was actually right over here uh, on about 30 yards from the section line right here. So why were they over there? Well, a lot of folks had been collecting things from the neighborhood for a while. And there was one report uh, of a, an area in the ground about 90 by 120 feet that looked like the remnants of a stockade, but it was over a mile away from where we now know the fort was, but it was on higher ground, uh, significantly higher. <clears throat> it, it, and I don't know why it was so hard to overcome the idea that the French wanted to be close to the water because with bateaus carrying that much weight, they wouldn't want to have to transport all the stuff from the ri river any further than necessary. So I, I had no prejudice against low ground. But when, and once I read Butler's and Brent's report, I figured it's got to be in the bottomland because that floods. Anyway. This is another uh, map that was in the fo folder. Uh, it shows uh, some of the landmarks in the neighborhood, but we don't learn a whole lot from it that we don't already know. This is an interesting map. This map was in the Butler collection and it was uh, drawn allegedly by a general named Isaac Brock as late as 1813. Brock, if you remember from the War of 1812 became uh, an ally and close friend of Tecumseh. <clears throat> and at the, uh, the Battle of Queenland's Height, he was killed. Uh, but before that happened, he made this sketch of the area around Wiatnam. But I can't believe it's genuine because he labels this as west. And it's actually north because the river runs east-west that we ought not. So this, is, this confuses the record. And that's and since Brock was never actually at we ought not, that we know of, uh, that, that's why I give the, the caution, beware of secondary sources and tertiary sources. <clears throat> uh, in 1888, uh, a gentleman named B. Wilson Smith uh, located the Fort We ought not by his own proclamation at the mouth of Indian Creek, which is four miles west of the Wiatnon Bottoms. Uh, and the only reason he did that is because he was convinced that that Indian Creek was the creek that was referred to uh, as the River de Bois Rouge. Uh, he did a lot of research, uh, but mostly speculation. Uh, he, he established his version of Wiatnon as being on a high piece of ground where the blockhouse now stands. And apparently his family <clears throat> followed the lead and his, his, daughter, his uh, <clears throat> daughters, I guess, uh, were responsible, well, they were members of the DAR. And the DAR monument was placed alongside the road at where the blockhouse now it stands, well before the blockhouse was built. So he thought that's where the fort was. Others uh, looking at the time, uh, or skeptical about it because he had no in, intrinsic evidence of any kind other than some general references. Um, the, the clincher, uh, we'll get to it here. Mr. Crockett is mentioned and I'll come back to him if I can. Uh, In 1885, an 
organization was put together called the Indiana Academy of Science. The spring meeting of that organization was held out here at Wyatnam. <clears throat> they, Mr. Butler wrote a, a memo of visit uh, and it was a rainy day apparently, so not everybody went, but those that did uh, enjoyed picking up Indian beads from a, a sandy ridge off the, off the photograph here and uh, mentioned that they went further west uh, along a ridge that paralleled the river and found a remarkable debris from what had to be European habitation. This was in 1897. So people knew where it was then. But between 1897 and 1963, uh, there weren't many folks interested in investigating it. But the few that did, uh, I interviewed a guy in uh, 1964 named Joe O'Brien, who told me uh, he was a kid back then and lived near Vietnam, near the Vietnam Bottoms. And they would go hunting when the river flooded. They would not hunt with guns, they would hunt with clubs. And I said, well, how did you do that? He said, when the river flooded, it left islands in the bottom land and the rabbits would be trapped because they wouldn't swim. So they would go hunting for rabbits during the flood. One, one such hunting uh, expedition occurred on this land right here, which was shown as Goose Island uh, as early as 1813 and uh, confirmed in the first survey of the county in 1834. <clears throat> uh, the reason I mention it is because a hundred or skeletons or more were washed out by the flood. And uh, we think they were probably we all that died from the smallpox epidemic that hit in 1734. Uh, and, and other times, but that was one year that when they reported uh, that kind of uh, result. Uh, anyway, so that there's an interesting uh, history here of this island uh, not being referred to uh, very early by any source. Uh, we have to figure out what happened to the river <clears throat> to make the fort 70 yards from the river because uh, there's no way that the, the fort could be 70 yards from the river at this point. Um, the area that the Indiana Academy of Science folks uh, explored was right down here. And using their report in 19, uh, what was it, 65, during spring break, a friend and I went out there and followed the directions in the minutes of the Indiana Academy of Science and found the site of the fort and was later confirmed, of course, but the first time on it, uh, I found a gun, a gun lock and a lot of gun flints and then pipe stems and all the usual stuff that you see on an 18th century site. Um, I'll speed it up a little bit. In 1963, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Bill Schulte and his wife, Mary, who liked to ride horses in the river bottom, uh, after the 63 flood over here on this part, discovered a huge amount of trade goods and artifact material from 18th century trading. And intuitively thought that it was the site of the Weah town across the river from the fort. So once Doc and Mary found the Weah town, we were pretty certain that the fort had to be in that vicinity. Um, <clears throat> In uh, 1966, uh, I visited the site, this site with uh, Doc Schulte and uh, his English teacher from school, a man named Tewksbury, who reported that on a sandy mound right here in 1922, a horse skeleton with a Native American, presumably, skeleton on it was found washed out by the flood. With the burial was a 12 inch silver cross, which <clears throat> was <laughs> flabbergasting for that time and place. Uh, and I thought, oh boy, here we go. Here's another, another uh, 
local legend, folklore tale about Wyatnan that I don't want to repeat unless I know more about it. Well, uh, 20 years later, uh, a local columnist named Jack Alkire located a priest in Japan who had the cross and verified the story. So, <clears throat> so we knew that it had to be somewhere near Wyatnan at that point because there were uh, other burials found within a half mile uh, of significant individuals with and very impressive grave goods um, that you wouldn't find likely away from a major trading site. Anyway, uh, there was a gentleman named uh, Crockett, William Crockett, who was a lawyer here in Lafayette. When I learned of his interest in Wyatnam, we started corresponding. He was then retired, as I should be, uh, in Florida. <laughs> so I never actually met him face to face. But he was a wealth of information about the history of Wyatnan. And the one thing that he did uh, that ties what we have at the museum with this site uh, is that uh, the eventual discovered site of the fort was called the Allen site at one time. Uh, and he knew it as the Allen site. He was familiar with visits people had made. And uh, a friend of his who had a metal detector uh, years ago, uh, promised to take him out there and see what they could find, but they never got to it. Anyway, in 1965, when I located the site, I began surface collecting, uh, and I was fairly certain that it was the site of the fort, but that's not scientific. That's just, that's a collector's uh, story. Um, I met two guys out there in 66 named John Henry and Larry Chowning who were also looking for Wyatnan. And I think John said, do you know where Fort Wyatnan is? Are we close? <laughs> I said, I was, I didn't want to tell him, but I had to because I was caught red handed on the site. I mean, this is it. I said, you'll never be any closer to it than you are now. So that started a lifelong friendship. Um, in 1967, I did a, a one meter test square on the uh, Southern boundary of the site. Uh, and uh, found some very, very intriguing chinking that left impressions of logs approximately a foot in diameter. That winter uh, in 67, uh, I was invited to attend a meeting at the Lafayette Country Club with uh, Bill Schulte, uh, Dr. Jim Keller from the uh, Glenn Black Lab at, at IU, uh, and uh, Henry Hawkins, who was secretary of the Indiana Historical Society, Alameda McCullough, who was then the curator for Tippecanoe County Historical Association. And we had a nice dinner and it was show and tell for Dr. Keller, uh, who by the end of the meal was convinced that they should do uh, uh, field excavations on the site the next summer. The next summer came, the field, ex ex uh, actually field excavations were planned, crew was organized, recruited, uh, in the spring, uh, about a month ago, the site was plowed in 1968. Nobody had told the farmer not to plow the site that year. Unfortunately, he had purchased a new tractor and a new plow and plowed about four inches deeper than he'd ever plowed before. And what happened was, oh, back up. <clears throat> This rectangular area in the soil was revealed as uh, a highly irregular occurrence. Uh, it shows a rectangular uh, feature uh, about the same size as the reported site size of the fort. Uh, unfortunately, the river in 22 carved out a, a flood channel down along here. So whatever was from here over to the river was obliterated. It is 70 yards from here to the old river bank, which matches up with every report that we have. So we were uh, actually, this is in our plan shadow. Everybody always looks and says, what's that? <clears throat> anyway, this is what we found. On the ground, this is what it looked like. There were huge stones carved out, which I hypothesized might be uh, hearth stones, 
uh, because they were oriented north-south linearly about 30 yards apart. Here's another uh, photo. Each photograph shows a little different aspect of what's out there. So this is the site that uh, Dr. Keller initiated excavations on in 1968. They did uh, excavations in uh, 68, 69. In 70 and 71, uh, private excavations were done on the plow zone only. And then uh, Michigan State got interested in 1974. So through 74, through 79, they did five years of archeology span on the site. Um, we're fairly certain even there, no, there's no sign that says this is we out none. Uh, there were two wells. Archaeological excavation shows that there were two stockades. One that is the size that was originally reported by Butler and Brim. But the second one is never mentioned. The garrison at Wiatnam was increased from uh, 12 to 57 at the beginning of the French and Indian War. But there's no mention ever of that many French Marines being at Weon. So I'm speculating that perhaps there was some administrative shuffling going on and the budget for Weon was funding activities somewhere else uh, until the war broke out. Uh, we don't, that's one of the mysteries of Weon. Uh, what happened to the river and what happened uh, to the stockade? Um, in 1791, when Scott visited the site with his militia, he reported they burned all the villages in the vicinity before they left. Uh, no mention of a stockade by any, either Scott in his report or any of his subordinate officers uh, after action reports. So we think perhaps by then the stockade was completely gone, left with a left a, a a bunch of traders' huts, uh, maybe just not even traders, some of them. Um, so that's that's uh, that's where we out none is. These are some of the features that were plowed out in uh, 68. Every angle gives you a little bit different perspective on the site. And there's some interesting other features. I'm going to point to it right here. And then down uh, up river, there are some other features. I don't know if I can get a shot far enough back to, uh, yeah. <clears throat> there's some things going on down here and we don't know what that is yet. We do know that there's a, maybe a, an archaic midden down that way. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I took longer than I planned and I cut some stuff out that wasn't really necessary, um, hoping that there might be some questions I can answer. Um, yes, ma'am. Oh, over here? Or here? Closer to the river, the lighter color. Soil. Yeah. 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 Yeah, any, any coloration differential is uh, natural at this point, uh, other than what, what you're seeing in the center here. This is a brush pile of, of flotsam that the farmer cleaned up and burned, just so you archaeologists know yeah. it's out there. <laughs> but this, I mean, the, the uh, this is a lane that runs down the river. This is just a swath cut through the vegetation um, that wasn't plowed. Sandy strip runs east and west. Yeah. You can see it on both sides of the road. Right here? It's all the yeah. Yeah, it's all yeah, okay, this is a ridge that's been washed by the, the river as it flooded periodically. And the ridge continues on another probably three eighths of a mile uh, downstream before it kind of smooths out. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. It's sandy. 
That's why it's that color. The uh, the test fit I did in '67 uh, was around 33 inches deep, and at the bottom of it was sterile sand. So there's a lot of a lot of alluvial stuff brought out there over the decades, over the centuries. Any other questions? Yes, sir. the test pit, I intentionally left a log in the in the ground. I didn't leave a note in a bottle or anything, but I left a note or I left a log that would be easily identified as something intrusive. Anybody anybody still awake have a question? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, between the excavations done by like IU and MSU, are all the Yatnan like artifacts that were recovered spread out between like these universities? Or are they all back with CPHA now? Good question. The uh, artifacts, in a nutshell, the artifacts from IU's excavations in uh, 68 and 69 are virtually all at the Glenn Black Laboratory in Bloomington. All of the material recovered by Michigan State. Uh, from 74 to 79 are in the collections here at TCHA now. Yes, sir. With uh, all the river washed out over the years, uh, the tree line that goes left and right here at the bottom, has any research been done below that? What I had here is a, <clears throat> I apologize for the quality. This is an actual survey of the river at the location of the fort. And I, I know nobody can see it. Sorry, I'll remember. Uh, it's right here. Okay. The lines are so faint that it's very difficult to, uh, to see, but uh, the old river channel. That I believe was active and you and in full swing back in the 18th century came across from here across this area, much further north than the channel is now. The we are town was down here on this south bank, and the actual survey of the island that was made in 1834 shows that a huge portion of the eastern part and southern part of the island has been washed away. There was never any reference to an island that we have known from historic visitors anytime. Uh, one of the clues that's very faint is that uh, we have known translates to place where the water goes around, swirls perhaps, uh, which is often associated with rapids, and uh, but not necessarily with a change of a river channel where it goes around an, an island. There is a rapid right here in the river. Uh, so we're pretty certain that's the rapid that was referred to as locating way out there. But as far as the river uh, is concerned, I think it had a mind of its own uh, when the upstream drainage changed uh, back in 1885. The river started creeping south and abandoned this old channel up here and cut a swath right through the way out town. I've asked, there's no, but no experts in this stuff anymore. <laughs> they all want to do stuff that makes money. <laughs> this doesn't. Uh, but that's what I think has happened. Uh, and if we get some intrepid divers who could see in the dark to dive out here in the river and comb around, there may be a lot of artifactual material that's deflated down to the river bottom. But the trouble is there's so much mud down there, you can't see it. Yes, sir. Ma'am. 
Yes. Um, I'm going to step over here. This is the government's representation that, uh, that there was an island there at some time. The actual island is here. And the river ran over on the north side of the island during the 18th century. So now it's not an island anymore. It's just left high and dry with a dry river channel on the north side of the island. And that leads us to another interesting speculation that uh, perhaps the wheel town actually extended over here. If the north bank of the river was here, uh, there may be sites on this island that need to be explored. Unfortunately, we don't own the island. Uh, and we have friends that own the island. So that's, that's something to look at in the future. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you guys for coming and paying attention. Not everybody's as fascinated by the, the stuff as I am. Thank, thank you. you.